Okay, so last time in Act 8, we looked pretty much at the imperative of intentional evangelism. Do this. Some of the why, but definitely to do this. Yeah? And one of the weaknesses of that was that it left us still facing questions of how. Right? Yeah, we won't do that, but how? I have to admit, I've seen so many books and I've heard so many talks on this sort of question, how to do evangelism. That are absolutely adamant you must do it like this. I've seen so many of those that are not biblically rooted. I feel this great, great sense of reluctance to ever go into a how to about this sort of thing, you know? A great reluctance about how to sermons in general, but we don't have some of them. I feel a great reluctance about them because the real biblical answer on the how to of intentional evangelism just lays bare this fact that it springs from walking with God. It springs from exercising the personal character, the personality that your walk with God develops in you. It springs from doing what you know to do as a Christian already. Now, there are regular common features for all of us, as we saw last time, but frankly, so much of it is all about communicating the truth of God through the personality that He develops in you as you walk with Him. You know, we're talking about intentional evangelism, right? As if the intention was ours. But actually the intention is, is God's. Because we walk with a God who, by very nature and character, reaches out to people who are lost and without Him and don't deserve Him. And as we're walking with Him, then we're going to be doing what He's doing. And what He's doing is He's... Do you see what I mean? The fundamental issue is the way we walk with our God. And that's evident in Philip's experiences as we look at them today. Now, somebody thanked me last time for the boy and question of how it came up, and you might think my response was unhelpful, but I'm going to regurgitate it. I think I said something like this, it's all a matter of just doing what you do. It's all a matter of just doing what you do. And I gave two safe examples from long ago, you know, examples from long ago are probably safe today. When the street team that we were involved with, the students in the IQ, our student Christian Union, was, was forming and was doing its stuff. <clears throat> and along came a guy who said, I can't do that. I haven't got any gifts. I haven't got, I haven't got any gifts. And I remember saying to the guy, what do you do in spare time? He said, I play the bagpipes. Brilliant, what are you doing Saturday morning? What do you mean? Bagpipes, Saturday morning. St. Michael said, the shopping centre, really nice. We'll be there, what time? Out night, right? Off we went. And he turned up and he, he came, bless him, he entered into the spirit of it. He came in the full tongues. You know, he was properly equipped with a proper, you know, spar and everything. Bagpipe, full nine yards. And then he stood in the middle of it and he said, what do we do now? I said, play. I'm going to play. We'll play Amazing Grace. So play something, right? You play something and then see what happens next. So he played and this crowd gathered in this sort of thoroughfare in the shopping centre. And they all gathered around. And once they all gathered around, I drove away again by preaching at him. But, but that wasn't the point. The point was he, he found what he had. He was doing what he did. This is what he did. He's a bagpiper. Fantastic. Get a bagpipe there a minute. And he got a bagpipe and he built the crowd and he preached the gospel. Doing what you do. Doing what you know to do. And another one was a, a young girl, who, you've heard me say this before, some of you, perhaps a young girl who, who had become a Christian. I was going to my second year, I think. She'd become a Christian the summer before, and she'd just come up to the university. So everything was big and new. And, and, and she was quiet, quiet, little lad. And it was really odd. She, some tent mission had come to her little village where she lived. Uh, before, you know, the summer before she came up to university, and she'd gone to this thing, and she had been converted in this tent, in the, and there was, she didn't know any other Christians. She, she didn't know that there were other young people who were Christians, like, like she suddenly discovered in the Christian Union at the university, it was a big old job, there was a lot of us there. And I stood up and I gave a little advert to say, come and help us with this open air work, and all these sort of trendy, and you know, people didn't come. This little girl came. She really was little, and she was timid. Do you think I might possibly be able to help? And my immediate thought, shame on me, was some Zen Buddhist in Oxford is going to have her for breakfast. But she came. And do you know what? She was brilliant. She's better than the rest of us. In terms of getting people to church the following Sunday. You go and preach in the up there on a Saturday, and on the Sunday morning, she has three or four people in church with her. Nobody. church on Sunday morning, oh, and then I'll cook her some lunch. And that's what she could do. <coughs> she could do that. She could do cooking people lunch. And she did it. Tons of people came with her to church the next morning. 
week after week after week. The key to what we learn from Philip today is to do what you do, not for spiritual laws. The key that we learn from Philip today is, is about how you actually do your intentional evangelism, not like what it says in so many of the books, which are a bit of a growth industry. It's this, Philip was available to God. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, so he started out. He was available to God, Acts 8, 26-7 and Acts 8, 29-30. Make sure I'm telling you what's in the book. Philip was constantly available to God. Now God, as we've said, is an outreaching God. And the Spirit of God goes throughout the earth all the time, seeking out those that God is going to save. Right? Now we've got to work with that. The job for us is to get to work with what he's doing. Does that make sense? So if we're going to grow useful and effective in our intentional evangelism, as a feature of our spiritual life, then the first foundational requirement, we've really got to walk with God. We've got to learn to live by His grace, learn to live daily by faith, learn to live in a restored fellowship with God because of Christ and His cross, functionally following Jesus. That's the first thing. Because what we're trying to do is fall in step behind Him. Because this is what He's doing. And you know, you expect me to say this, that means one shed load of praying try and catch up with where he is and what he's doing. See, we, we, we take this view that, you know, evangelism is something that we do to people, right? And actually, it's what he's doing. And we get to be part of that by falling into fellowship with him. Does that make sense? Now, you, uh, you're looking a bit stunned or tired or something. Uh, but, but let me know if you see what I'm saying to you. Functionally following Jesus. That means a lot of praying. A life of intentional evangelism is by no means an alternative to a life of prayer. It's not that you choose evangelism because you're a go-getter and prayer is too passive a pastime for you. It's a travesty, it's a nonsense, it's a complete failure of biblical understanding. For a follower of Jesus in those early days, being a Christian didn't mean just having responded in a big meeting gone to the front, prayed the prayer, believed the basic points of doctrine you were told to believe, and changing where you hang out on Sunday mornings. In those days, think of following Jesus in those early Galilean days, following him round, living and ministering on the road. It was a matter of keeping up with him, wasn't it? Where's he going? Where's he going now? You know, they got that marvellous picture in Luke's Gospel, halfway through Luke, where Luke's tempo changes and he picks up on, it says, uh, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem and the disciples were following him in the way. It's like he's, he's heading out steadfastly. He set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. You know? And there he goes. And the, like the disciples are fanning out. Trying to keep up. Hey, Lord, we're going. What's this about? We don't get this. What's this for? Who oh, I'm going there. Why? And so on. Following Jesus meant actively looking for where Jesus was going or was sending you and determinedly, diligently chasing after that. Frankly, keeping up. Now what is prayer about that? What is a life of prayer with that? Keeping up with where he's going and what he's doing. So Philip saw his discipleship as fellowshipping with God, looking for God's ways, walking in God's ways, sacrificially, deliberately, personally. First in generalities, then in specifics. He was available to God. And if we are to see intentional evangelism as a fundamental aspect of following the Jesus who himself deliberately evangelized, then we need to be daily seeking his will, the will of God for us in that time and place, seizing upon doing it immediately and deliberately. First in the generalities, and then in the specifics. First in the generalities that put us in the way of usefulness, and then in the specifics that get us into conversation with the people that God's already at work to bring them to himself. A huge lot of praying involved. As you walk around, as you go about Day by day. Generalities, verse 27. The Lord said, Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. So he called a committee. So he formed a support organization. So he made sure the pension plan was in order. So he went. He 
meant. Here is the response, don't forget in this context, here is the response to the persecution that broke out against Stephen. This is all part of the response that comes to the church being scattered. Philip could have taken up a career in politics to influence society. Philip could have started a pressure group to fight back against the political oppression of blah 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 blah. But actually his response was to walk more closely with his God and to follow his God in pushing forward the kingdom of God. And how do you do that? To live with evangelism, the tension of evangelism. So, we're answering the question, how on earth am I to do this? And the most fundamental, basic, primary response to that question is found here being available to God. First, in the vague things, then in the specific things. God asked Philip to leave the thriving new church in that Samaritan city, where there were plenty of pagans to evangelize, and still lots of good stuff that needed to be done, with a growing, thriving church to support him and sort out his pension plan, to go from there and go down to what? No idea. Well, some idea. A desert road. He's been amongst the Samaritans there, an ugly bunch, but now he's going down to a desert road amongst the Philistines. Biblically, pretty much a step further on from the Samaritans, isn't it? And it's going to go a lot further away than that shortly, as we're going to find out. So he went. So he went. There's a tremendous integrity in Philip here. Being a Christian is essentially and primarily being a follower, a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And that means being committed to listening out for his leading, for where he's taking me. That's hard. So he started out. Those four words cover a lot. A lot of sacrifice on the part of Philip. He had this big success and now God says walk away from him. Off you go. <coughs> Not easy to do is it man? Some, some of the people are leading me there. Come with me in your mind's eye to Monday and Sunday lot. When there's a long list of things to do, but to-do list, and it's a long one. And uh, as you're about to go home to get on with this, it's as if the Lord might be saying to you, you really need to call the call. As if the Lord's saying to you, he might be saying to you, you really need to call the call. And the difficulty with it, it seems to me, is that it's almost obvious as if that's what the Lord might be saying. It's never on the sky, is it? It's never written there. There's never sort of writing in the clouds that says, Go to the go up. You don't get that. It, it, it might be. I don't know. It might be saying this. If it were written on the sky, it'd be easy. There'd be no problem, no doubt. And then we wouldn't be placing justifying faith in it. That wouldn't be living by faith. Now, now look, this really isn't for like. This is the fundamental issue when it comes to being intentional about our evangelism. It flows out following Jesus. And you don't get it written on the sky, you've got to trust for it. You kind of think, perhaps I should do that. Where's that come from? Don't know. Mm, might be him. I trust you to do that. It flows out of actually listening for his voice and going where he leads on weekdays as well as Sundays. In fact, particularly on weekdays. And that's what living as a follower of Jesus does with you. Philip takes that risk. He goes to the irrational place and to the most unpromising people. He does that against a life lived by mere reason. He does it because he feels the angel of the Lord is told him to. And off he goes. Okay, so how do we willing to trust the Lord and act on it in general terms? The Spirit now comes to Philip in the unlikely place, in the desert. And the Spirit told Philip, verse 29, go to that chariot and stay, in, stay near to it. There's the specifics. Verse 29. That chariot, stay near it. And Philip ran up to the chariot. Oh, do you, Philip? This is where the pressure really starts to come on. Because the chariot is a lumbering chariot or ox cart. He's not Ben Hur. He's got one of these big travelling carts probably pulled by an ox for long distance travel because an ox will keep going. And uh, he's a foreign official. He's an important sort of man. He's a chamberlain, a money, money man for, it says in the NIV, Candace, the Queen of Ethiopia. Now let's just unpack that. Ethiopia then was what we call Sudan now. We call it Sudan now. The guy's a black African, proper black African. And uh, from Homer onwards, it, that part of the world was 
had what was known as the ends of the earth. From Homer onwards, it's described as the ends of the earth. Can you remember Acts 1 8? You're going to take the gospel from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, where? The ends of the earth. That's how we describe it. So already the gospel's getting to the ends of the earth, isn't it? Already back to chapter 7, chapter 8. Amazing. Ethiopia, Sudan, then. The ends of the earth. This guy's a very black African, visually really very different. I mean, he's not like this. He's a strange person to talk to. And he was a eunuch, as such high officials regularly were. But even for the Hellenized Jew, we find Philip was. This meant the man, however interested that man would be in Judaism, he would be an outcast from the Jews, would not be allowed even to enter the temple of Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 23.1 forbade such people entering the temple. He's, I don't know what's going on yet. Has he been all that way from Sudan via Egypt to the Jerusalem temple seeking God, only to find that he's been turned away? He can't go in. You're a unit, you can't come in. Here. Interesting that that's what Deuteronomy 23 says, but Isaiah 56 through 8 offers such people as him a much brighter future. And that day begins to dawn with Philip in Acts 8. I found that fascinating. God's doing something fresh and new and different here. He was the high official, not of a queen called Candace, but of the Candace of Ethiopia, the queen mother. Candace means the queen mother. It's not a particular person's name, it's, it's a role. And what you've got in, in that society is that they tended not to name the fathers of the prince, because the father was supposed to be the son god. It's a little bit weird. But that's the way it was. They didn't name their fathers. And it looks as if she was acting as the regent for a young ruler at that time. So he is the money man. He's the chancellor of the exchequer for the regent of... Okay. Happy with all that? Why on earth do you think such a person should be remotely approachable? That's the point I'm building up to. Why would you think you can talk to a person like that? But God is preparing a way in for Philip with the gospel. There is nobody you can't talk to about Jesus. If the Queen comes for tea, did you used to think that when you were a kid? You used to dream of the Queen coming to your house for tea. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? No? Okay. Well, okay. And, uh, <laughs> lovely marvellous, wouldn't be cool? Well, if she comes for tea, you can talk to her about Jesus. That'd be a great idea. Actually, judging by the last few Queen's speeches at Christmas, um, she might like to chat on that subject. <laughs> See, there's nobody you can't talk to about Jesus. The strangest people, the most high-ranking people, the most intimidating-looking people, the most important in inverted commas people, as well. So Philip ran up to the alien eunuch's chariot and immediately ran into a situation where Philip had to adapt himself. Philip had to adapt himself to the situation he encountered. He needs to be sensitive, verse 30. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot, stay near it, and Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard this man reading Isaiah the prophet, presumably in a Sudanese accent. <clears throat> I think intentional evangelism means getting others to be like you, rather than you adapting yourself to them, in order to serve them in the gospel. You're not an evangelist, but a cultural imperialist. Does that make sense? And frankly, we've already got plenty of those out there, thank you very much. We don't need more of that. So Philip ran up to the lumbering ox cart, and to his enormous surprise, the big black guy who'd been thrown out of the temple was sat there reading the prophet Isaiah out loud, probably in quite a high voice. about Jesus and this guy's going to get saved. So Philip dropped into character as Philip the deacon, chatty man. That's what it takes. Philip deacon, chatty man, verses 30b to 31. You heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet? Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked him. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Whoa! He's in the limousine! <laughs> Fantastic! How often do you get invited into one of them? 
Well, these days are a bit different, isn't it, on a Friday night, but, but you get the picture. Here's the diplomatic car. Come on in, oh, thanks so much. What do you expect of Philip? I mean, what do you expect of him? What had Philip's role been in the Church of Jerusalem? He'd been the deacon. He'd been the guy looking after the, the widows and the poor and the orphans. He'd learned to be a chatty man, a listening sort of guy. Don't you think his job there required that he should grow into being an approachable, friendly, caring, thoroughly chatty <coughs> man? So, so as he walks down that road and as he approaches this high official's chariot thing, conveyance, he's already got a Christian life full of growing into a chatty man to call on. Growing into the ministry God had given him already. If you're not chatting to people, you know, you simply can't chat to them about Jesus. You can't chat to them about Jesus unless you're a chatty man. And there are safety issues, and there are cultural variations in how we do it, but the principle always still holds. Philip's going along, people watching, head up, looking for contact, looking for interaction. Morning! Lovely day! He didn't quite want a good coat you got there. I used to get stick for this in, in my last church in the church before, um, going around doing door to door work. Because I pop up to the door and I, I develop quite a knowledge of garden plants. Well, if you're knocking on somebody's door in their front garden, what are you going to talk about? Hell, oh, I like that burger, that's looking really smart, isn't it? I said, have you had it long? Oh, then. We're chatting. Now, I'm not there to talk about horticulture. But you see the problem? Unless you're a chatty sort of person, how are you going to. You know, and that doesn't mean being an outward going extrovert. That doesn't mean being you know, a pushy sort of person. It just means within your character, within who you already are, as a disciple of Christ, being a chatty one. Philip's got his eyes and ears open, his head up as he's walking along. He's a chatty guy. And he asks open, relevant questions. People love to be asked for their opinion. Have you not noticed? Have you not noticed? What are we doing as evangelicals in the West when we go into situations to evangelise people and we don't do any listening? We're always talking. Come here, there's a wall of words. Bang your head on that. Okay, no. Philip says, do you understand that bit? How's that going? God, bloody hell. How am I going to understand this unless somebody explains it to me? I'm an Hebrew, isn't it? How do you get this? What's he talking about? Is he talking about himself? Is he talking about somebody else? What's he talking about? Philip says, he asks open, relevant questions and he is invitable. It's not that Philip had to invite the guy to his house. How often does Jesus invite people to his house? You invite people to your house and you're in the strong position, you're on the front foot straight away. Jesus usually goes to other people's house when he's invited there because then he's the guest, he's on the back foot. He puts himself in the vulnerable position and explains the gospel. Is this making sense? It's a great comfort to some of us who haven't quite finished all the plastering in the house. You know? but, but there's an issue here. Philip comes up in his chariot because he's an invitable in sort of person. Learn to ask interesting questions. Learn that people don't come to Christ by having you dump truth on their toes. Learn to be an invitable sort of person. Philip has cultivated the art of being available, affable, invitable. We tend to think that faithfulness to God has to involve being separate from social interaction. Don't go to parties. Don't be friendly. You don't have to be angular to be evangelical. Newsflash! You have to be conditioned by grace, as well as seasoned with salt. A palatable, acceptable sort of person. But notice here, please, Philip was able to turn sensitivity, affability, an opinion-seeking, questioning spirit, he was able to turn that very quickly to biblical explanation. Because he's a nice guy. All that warm, personal interaction is critical, crucial stuff. But it serves the purpose of building relationships where explain the Bible can take place. Now you never know where it's going to go. You never know where it's going to go. 
give an example last Sunday, uh, no, yesterday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, Calvin and I did a little wrecking and it involved going somewhere and we ended up on local farm. Funny how that happens. And we ended up there with somebody we know having a chat and he was having some cattle carving. And so we jumped straight in and got involved in cattle carving. Now, uh, mercifully, because they were quite poking cattle, we didn't end up, you know, up to you in a cow, right? Didn't go that way. Great, fantastic. They were coming on, they were quite jumpy. And, you know, we were able to chat and listen and interact. Cal was able to time the contractions of the cow and see how close she was going to be. It was great, you know, we're getting quite, yeah, you better watch that one. She's going to be quite close now. Oh, the other one, that's a bit closer. Yeah, right? chat, chat, chat. And, and Cal stayed with one and I walked off and we had a good listen to somebody. I had a good listen to somebody. You know, we talk about having a good talk to somebody, don't we? A good conversation. Oh, yeah. well, did you have a good listen? Did you ask the open questions? Were you approachable? Were you affable? And did you bring biblical truth to what you came to hear? Philip has been open, chatty, interested and affable, but his question has turned the topic to what on earth Isaiah 53 is all about. What a full toss on the leg stump that must have been. Don't be afraid of a full toss on the leg stump. You know what to do? Oh, it's just cricket. Sorry. Sorry for those who are not cricket people, but let me tell you, if you get a full toss on the leg stump, there's only one thing you ever want to do, and that's hook it to the boundary. Right? If you get a full toss given you on your leg stump, that is a delivery of a hook, and Philip gets given a full toss right on his leg stump. And he goes for the hook. He starts here. He starts where we are, which is important. He starts with Isaiah 53. He deals with some essential truth about Jesus that's written about the 7th or 8th century BC. And there's a whole lot of stuff that gets left out there. So he takes him forward from there and explains a whole lot else as well. He's just got all day. He's sitting in the desert in the chariot, enjoying the sunshine. We've got all day. But Isaiah 53 open and we're going to talk about this. This is about Jesus. And what Jesus is about is it. And what Jesus means for you is this and this and this and this. And what Jesus did was that and that. And what it means is, you know, repent and be baptized, God. Just do it. You need to do that. I don't care if you're Candace's whatever jobby thing, but, you know. I don't care if you're human either. You know, this is what you need. You need Jesus and you need to be converted. And this is how you do it. You repent and follow Jesus. Repentance and baptism are an integral part of the message. Paul is not just Philip. I call him Paul. Well, anyway. Philip, he is not just a deal describer. There are a lot of deal describers out there. Philip, Philip is not just a deal describer, he is a deal clincher. You see? It's not just that we go out and we say, well, Christians believe that. That's what we were allowed to do in schools. We're not allowed to do more than that in schools, are we? Christians believe that. He says, and what this means for you is this. You need to turn from sin, trust Jesus, and show up by your baptism. He goes way beyond the description. He's taught the Ethiopian what Jesus said and did, but he goes on to get the implications of that realised in the experience of this high official. He's not saved once he knows. He's saved once he's saved. And Philip is prepared to follow right through and clinch the deal. As they travel along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? Where did that come from? That's not in Isaiah 53. No, Philip's gone on and explained the rest of it to him. And he hasn't held back from the point of commitment and decision and change your life and be baptised in this water. And face what Kandaki says afterwards. Philip is prepared to follow right through and clinch the deal with a person who already seems ready for that and prepared for it because God has been working there already. How's Philip got there? He's taught the need for decision already. I don't know if he's learned that lesson from Peter and John in the, in the city in Samaria to follow through and teach the rest they need to know. We don't know. We don't know if that's the case. But he's certainly doing it now. And he's not afraid to go for it. Why shouldn't I be baptised? Stop the chariot. Both Philip and Eunuch went down in the water and Philip baptised him. He's not, he's not afraid to go for it. And once he's gone for it, he goes away. The Spirit of God takes him away. The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took him He's not there to get results. He's there to follow God. And if God now takes him away from a good thing, he could have gone down to Kandaki, you know? He could have gone down to the court in Sudan. He could have pioneered the evangelization of Africa south of the Sahara, which in the providence of God is going to wait for the 19th century, and C.T. Stiller, 
one of my favorite cricketing and missionary hero heroes, okay? The blood took him way back at the uh, western seaboard, east, uh, western seaboard, back up through Philistia, to Azotus, which is Ashdod, Philistinian city from the Old Testament, and back up to Caesarea, where he seems to be living. Because when we see Philip again in Acts 21, he's living in Caesarea and he's got daughters who prophesy. Yeah? A consistent Christ sharing Christian home. Now, I guess if you've <coughs> read a few books as I have about the how to of personal evangelism, you haven't been reading much of that, have you? It's not what it says in the books, but it seems to me to be kind of what it says in the Bible. And there's a snag for us. If I'd ask you to summarize it for me, what would you say? How'd you do this? How do you do this personal evangelism? How do you do this intention evangelism thing? How do you do that? <laughs> All of it springs from the life of the gospel, doesn't it? All of it springs from following Jesus, praying, being available to God, being chatty, being a deal clincher for the gospel when the time is right, befriending, explaining Bible, and calling to faith. Do you need to have gone to Bible college for that? Probably going to Bible college won't have helped you with that. Do you need to be a very well-read Christian to do that? Or should our kids who love Jesus be doing that tomorrow morning in school? And should we be doing that tomorrow morning in... Where are you going tomorrow? Where are you going tomorrow? Do you know? <laughs> no idea, I'm available to God. That's a marvellous answer. Well, why is that complicated? You know what you know. You need to do what you do. And walk with a God who is already reaching out and bringing people to himself to find those people so they get to know what they need to know. Help to follow through. And then move to the next. And the next. And the next. It begins to look, doesn't it, as if a life of intentional evangelism is actually a life of discipleship to Jesus. And doing what we already know to do. We'll see if there's anything to add to that next time, shall we? Because there's a series to run through yet.